Greetings, I'm Don C. Weber of Cutaway Security and a certified SANS instructor. In this ICS concept overview, we are joined by Michael Savoy, an electrical subsystems engineer. Mike is here to introduce us to the IEC 61131-3 programming language called Structured Text. He will cover the basic concepts of Structured Text and use an integrated development environment, or IDE, called CodeSys to demonstrate how to program in this language. If you enjoy this video and the topics we cover in the SANS ICS concept overviews, please be sure to like and subscribe to this channel. Leave a comment if you have a question about this topic or suggestions for future content. For this SANS ICS concept video, we have a guest speaker, Mike Savoy. Mike volunteered to join us and do another dive into the IEC 61131-3 programming languages. And this time we're going to be talking about structured text. So hi, Mike. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us a bit about yourself and then uh, go ahead and uh, start talking about structured text. Yeah, thanks, Don. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, so yeah, so my name is Mike Savoy. Um, currently, I am, a, uh, or I, I am the electrical subsystems engineer for a renewable energy company called Emergy. Um, I've been working in the, as a, an automation engineer in the industrial automation world for uh, about the last 10 years or so, um, doing various things from uh, PLCs, programmable logic controllers, uh, variable frequency drives, uh, VFDs, um, and in, the, in that power electronics space. Um, so I you know, get into a lot of uh, robotics, I get into a lot of manufacturing, um, and I get into a lot of, lot of fun applications that uh, kind of make, uh, make the world go round. Excellent. So, um, yeah, so today we're going to be, uh, you know, talking about the, the IEC 61131 programming languages, um, specifically going over structured text. Um, and I'm going to take a quick uh, kind of step back a little bit. And there are multiple languages um, in, the, in the 61131. Um, there's a ladder, which there's another video that, that Don's done. Um, function block, structured text, instruction list and uh, sequential function charts. So these can all be, be, be used in different ways. Uh, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, uh, it's not just that uh, any language is used as a, as a hammer. Um, you know, you can, use, you can use these for uh, in the, the best way, uh, the best possible way. Um, and and, and Mike, my, my understanding is, is that ladder logic is uh, used by a, a lot of, uh, it's really understood by a lot of older engineers, uh, but now uh, as we've progressed uh, and uh, I guess, I don't want to say improve, but structured text is uh, more consistent with some of the ways that uh, the newer generations uh, really look at the programming language. Is that your experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll say for the most part. Um, ladder logic is, it's, it's a graphical language. So it's typically used by your, 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 your technicians, the electricians, uh, the people who don't necessarily understand coding and, and programming. So they can go through and bring up their development environment, look at the code and see, you know, where, where these contactors are, are on or off and, and helps them troubleshoot a little bit easier. Um, the beauty with languages uh, like structured text is now we can start to do some uh, advanced uh, advanced concepts. So we can start to do things like arrays. Um, we can start to do you know while loops, um, things that make the programming a little bit uh, a little bit better, a little bit more concise. Um, and in my experience, um, it's been a heck of a lot easier to uh, to write the code. Um, I can. I can do a fair amount of damage with some programs in 100 to 150 lines of structured text that may take me, you know, multiple multiple rungs uh, to do the same thing in ladder. Um, I kind of started my programming background with C, uh, C plus um, plus. I wasn't the greatest C plus plus programmer to be honest. Once I started to learn Python, uh, my programming got a lot. Uh, it was a lot more familiar. It made a lot more sense to me. Um, and then once I learned about structured text, um, I was like, oh, this is amazing um, because now I can, you know, kind of like when you're doing your Python code, it's, you're literally writing it out um, in the beginning, you know, you're, if, if this switch goes on, then I want, you know, motor A to go on. Uh, and if motor A goes on, then I want to look and see what the temperature is 
if the temperature is over 100 Fahrenheit, then slow the motor down. So you can literally write a program like that um, as you would in Python, as you would in structured text. And if you were to do all that in ladder logic, uh, it can be, can be a little bit more difficult, a lot more, a lot more rungs uh, to use. Yeah, it, uh, it seems like the logic would be a little bit, uh, uh, in, from what I understand, you can still do those loops and other things in ladder logic. It's just a little bit uh, more difficult for uh, programmers uh, um, to uh, kind of understand. So, I mean, that, that's what it seems like to me. Yeah, I mean, the programming PLCs is a little different than uh, than programming, say, your, your standard web application, um, because, you know, everything goes left to right, and it goes top to bottom, and it's, and it's constantly cycling through. Um, whereas, uh, when you're in, uh, you know, a, a Python or, or C++, you know, you can kind of go through, you know, get to line 30, then all of a sudden, jump to another library somewhere down in, you know, line 500, and then, you know, go back up to line 30, 31 again. Um, with PLC programming, everything's very sequential. And so that's where it can, that, that, that's where if you're trying to, trying to do too many things too fast, um, that's where you can get, uh, get caught up in your programming. Um, and structured text helps to, uh, I'll say mer merge between a traditional programming language like a Python to uh, a more automation language like, like Ladder. Um, and I can I actually have an example that I can show uh, later on um, as to you know the differences between say a ladder and uh, and, a, and a structured text. So um, yeah, yeah, and awesome. Thank uh, it, thanks for uh, helping to, to clarify that for me, and I, uh, I'm looking forward to this. So thank you very much. Yeah. So um, yeah. So you know, kind of like I said, going going back to the Wikipedia page. Wikipedia is great. Um, it, it's a it's a good kind of first step into understanding, you know, what, what the language is. Um, you can kind of see the sample program here. Um, they've got, it looks pretty similar to, you know, what like a, a Python or, or C++ uh, would be. Um, it, this is, there's no, uh, it's not delimited sensitive or anything, um, unlike Python. Um, and you can, you know, you can call it your variables. Um, you're going to call them out whether they are, you know, Boolean, are they integers, are they double integers? So a lot of these familiar terms that you're, that you're used to from say a, a, C, a C or a Python uh, program. Um, so it looks like this one, um, looks like we have a, you know, a start stop button, we have an on off. Um, another thing to note in PLC programming is oftentimes you'll see these, uh, you know, percent IX 0, .0 that's actually a, a memory address. Um, that you're specifically calling out. Usually I is the standard notation for input, Q is, is the standard notation for output, and you can obviously read those in the comments. Um, your, uh, your double slash is your comment uh, mark. Um, you'll also see you know, ta task tick uh, interval. Um, so they're, this is where they're calling out kind of the uh, cyclic execution of, a, uh, of, of the task in a, in a PLC program, um, that's that's very important. If you don't assign a task to essentially call the program, it'll never run. Um, and then once you get down here, past these couple lines, you'll see you know end variables. There's an end configuration. Um, these are all parts of a PLC program. Um, they just may be hidden uh, in certain places depending upon the development environment that you use. Um, and then we actually get into the, the actual program. So. Uh, you know, you see here we're we're calling a uh, you know start stop on off, um, and it looks like this one is going to uh, on a trigger. So as soon as it sees a uh, a zero to one value, probably from a digital input, uh, that's when it's going to start. Um, and then it looks like uh, let's see on off on to trigger and not on off. Um, looks like this is when it's going to toggle essentially toggle on or off. So. This is one version of a, uh, of a structured text program. Um, and then I, I'm also going to uh, start to talk a little bit about uh, Codasys. Um, so Codasys is a, it's a, it's a development environment. Um, it's one that I use uh, a fair amount. I actually have 
three flavors of Codasys on my machine right now. Uh, so it's, it's used pretty uh, frequently throughout the, throughout the industry. Um, and we're just going to do a simple hello world uh, type program or, uh, you know, in the, in the automation industrial world, it's, can you turn on an LED, right? So, so we're knee deep into Codasys right now. Uh, I've already got the, already got the project written up. Um, just to kind of give you guys a uh, idea as to what's going on. Um, typically on the left-hand side is going to be kind of your, uh, your, your, your tree, um, usually where you're going to lay out your hardware. Um, in this case, we're actually using the Codasys for Raspberry Pi. Um, that way you, can get, you guys can uh, get in pretty, pretty inexpensively. You know, Raspberry Pis are $30, $40. Um, you can download the software from the Codasys uh, website uh, for free. Um, I think you just have to sign up for an account, um, but you can kind of get going uh, from there. Uh, and there's lots and lots of tutorials uh, out there on YouTube to uh, kind of walk you through some of the first, first steps and, and first projects. So one of the things you do once you get a new uh, project open up, opened up, um, is you'll go in and this is what I typically do. Um, I'll go into the, uh, the, uh, the IO uh, section of it and I'll go into the mapping. And this is where, depending upon um, you know, the vendor that you're using, they will have kind of their hardware profile uh, already mapped out for some global variables. And so uh, you can, once you expand these, uh, you can actually see some of the digital inputs, um, which are the pins on a Raspberry Pi. And you've got the digital outputs. And then remember, I was talking before about some of these addresses. We've got the, the inputs and then we've got the, the outputs. And these are all set up as uh, Booleans. Um, looks like there's some double words. Uh, we, can, we can sneak in there if we, if we really want to. Um, but all I did was just, I made a simple start as, a, as an input. And then I have a, a motor run. Um, you know, these variables can be anything that you guys, that you guys want. Um, and, and that's and, so, and, and that's mapping and, and that's creating a, a a reference to the actual pin and the reason why they're bullying is because it's going to be basically off or on uh, high or low uh, energized or not energized on that pin is that is that correct cor cor yes absolutely okay. correct so we can go into the uh, the PLC program and you'll see in that from that Wikipedia page you saw there was a kind of an upper section where they had you know program. Uh, PLC, PRG. This is this is essentially your main program. This is where everything is is kind of anchored off of. Um, you'll see variable, and you'll see end variable. And so, if I were to have a longer program, um, I could start to type in variables here, um, and that's where I could start to put in ints, uh, double double integers, words, double words. Uh, you could start to put those more local variables uh, in there. Um, because the variables that are here, these are, these are uh, global. So you could put some local variables in there, um, but then, you know, just as, as you would in any other uh, uh, program that you're, that you're typically doing, Python, C++, you know, it's, okay, if this action happens, then I want something else to, uh, to happen. So uh, right now, if motor run is true, basically. So if it's, if it's one, if it's high, then we want to start the motor. Uh, otherwise we want to have it as false. So if start is true, motor runs else it's false. And uh, I even put together a little visualization. Another fun feature with Codasys is I can actually start to uh, drag in some of these uh, various uh, icons um, or uh, visualization icons, um, and I can actually tag them to variables. Um, so variable here is whether motor is running or not. And so now I could, when we actually get this running, I can hit this motor switch and the light will, will turn on. So, um, so, that, so that's interesting. So Codasys is not only the um, programming interface, uh, but it also provides a limited uh, ability to generate an HMI. So to speak, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So in a lot of, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's all of them. Um, there is a visualization section where you can craft up a, 
an, an HMI within your machine. Um, and you, you can, uh, in some instances, I believe, uh, actually export that to, a, uh, to an HMI. Some vendors have a, uh, a separate programming uh, IDE for which, you, for which you can do that. Um, how you would do that is you would essentially just export out all of your, we call tags or variables. Mm -hmm. You could import that into their HMI uh, software and then you can start to line everything up. So would, would you expect to find, where would you expect, expect to find a Coda, uh, uh, Codesys, uh, Codesys? Within, the, <laughs> within the environment? Uh, so within a, a, um, a control network, would this just be on the um, engineers and the programmers workstations? Would you expect to find it uh, you know, on, uh, on, on an HMI, so to speak? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so no, it would, it would not be on an HMI. Um, Codesys is, is your, your, your IDE, your integrated development environment. So you're going to find it on the engineers' computers, um, you know, maybe, some, uh, maybe some of the technicians, um, depending upon how comfortable they are with coding. Um, but it's not something that's going to live on a PLC. It's not going to live on, a, uh, on, an, on an HMI. Um, really what happens with Codesys, um, and similar to, I know it, I'm referencing back to the, uh, the ladder logic one uh, as well. You're in this environment, you're in this development environment, and what you're going to do is you can go and compile it. So you would go to build, and then usually something down in the lower right-hand corner will kind of tell you what's going on, whether there's any errors or warnings or anything like that, you know, uh, expected a, a semicolon instead of a colon or you know, something is wrong with your code and it doesn't compile, just like you would in a, in a C++ type of environment. So if your code goes well, you should have, you know, obviously no errors, warnings, you know, it, it will likely work. There, there may be some bugs that, that show up, but you'll compile your code and then you can actually go online um, with your PLC. And so whether you're remoting into a certain PLC or you're, you're, you're physically in front of it connected over, USB or, or Ethernet, um, you're actually going to go and log in to the PLC. Um, and you'll see it comes up with a little warning and says, you know, the application doesn't exist on the device. Do you want to create it? And now we're actually downloading a compiled version of this program to, the, to your controller, to your PLC, to your Raspberry Pi. And now you can kind of see where, you know, it's coming up with, you know, starts false, motor runs false. And down here, it's kind of letting you know what's going on. Um, I actually have this in simulation mode, another fun feature of this flavor of uh, Codesys. Um, and so now I can actually start to force values um, onto it. So now I can go and, uh, and change whether or not the, you know, the, the motor's running or not. So um, you know, the nice way to do it is I go to my visualization um, and actually want to make sure that I'm running the code. So now it's actually looping through uh, this code that we're running every so many, so many milliseconds. And now when I go and I click on motor switch, now you can see my lamp turns on and off. So, and if I were to say, stop it, you know, doesn't matter what I do, this lamp is, is not going on. So obviously make sure that, oops, let me get the menu out of the way there. There we go. Sorry. Uh, Zoom difficulties. Uh, so once I hit play, now I can now I can toggle this button on and off. And to make it more fun, I can go back to my code and I can actually see the live code running. So if start is true, motor's running. And if I go and click on off, now these are back to false. Again, I can also go to the uh, the I/O tab. Um, all of these are false. I can go and click on that. And now I've got true and true. So, so it's a nice little, you know, closed loop uh, system where you can start to really test your code and see if it's, if it's, uh, if it's working or not. All right. So, yeah, so that was, that was real similar. This looks real similar to the uh, programming software that was provided by the Scenario Electric that we used, uh, Tom and I used to interact with uh, uh, the uh, M221 PLC. Um, I look over there because Oh, my, my gears over there. Um, the, uh, yeah, so that looks, uh, that looks, uh, this looks similar to that. And de definitely from that control standpoint, and, and it's, uh, 
I like to point that out because if you gain, if somebody gets access to this, then not only do they have all this information, tagging information and so forth, but if uh, like, for instance, you mentioned that you're in simulator mode, but you don't have to be in simulator mode. You can actually potentially point to an actual live device and be connected to that live device and making modifications to it as well. So, I mean, that's, uh, that's true, correct? That, that is true. Uh, I will say there is one caveat in the, in the sense that with a lot of the uh, code assist development environment, you actually have to have the original file. Um, with some other PLCs, um, I, can, I, can walk up, I can walk up to them, I can plug in my, my USB and I, can, and I can talk to the PLC and the code is actually right there on the PLC. So there's a rather large vendor in, in North America that has that um, feature bug, uh, however you want to determine that, um, where I can walk up in front of the PLC and I, and I will have all, all the code. So if I log into it, it's right there. With Codasys, however, I actually need to have the original file. Um, so you need, that, you need that project file in, in, to start yeah. with, and then, uh, and then it's able to interact with the endpoint device if it's actually got that program running, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So, so if you don't have that original file or I'll say that current file that's actually on the PLC, um, you're not gonna necessarily be able to see everything um, that's actually going on. Um, and in fact, when you log in uh, to the PLC, it may say something along the lines of, you know, what that warning that flashed up previously, um, it said that, you know, this is, this is different than what's on the PLC. Um, mm -hmm. Do you wanna, do you wanna download it? Um, and so, uh, the other key point that I'll, that I'll make is, um, you know, that, that compile project that you're, that you're downloading, you know, you can create in with some vendors in some instances, you can actually create a boot application. You know, you could email that, um, to a, uh, uh to an end user. Um, they can put it on like a, a little flash, little micro SD card or an SD card. And if the PLC is capable, they can put that onto, um, they can drop that onto the PLC and update the code uh, that way. But again, it's a compiled uh, compiled piece of software uh, that you're dealing with. So um, yeah, so just because you can get access to the PLC doesn't necessarily mean that you will have access to the code okay. um, in order to, to do everything. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, so, so this is a relatively simple project uh, that we did. Um, and I've got some other uh, uh, other code that I can show. Um, I'm actually going to bring up another flavor of uh, code assist here, um, and this is for uh, uh, this is for a wire cutting machine that I actually did uh, about uh, I guess 2019 uh, or so. Um, and so this was for a customer. Um, we had a, a variable frequency drive which had its own PLC built in, um, so it was kind of a soft PLC. And uh, so they have a, a library. So you'll see some of these addresses here, which refer to a specific library for this, this piece of hardware. Um, now this is one where I can log on to uh, this device and actually see, and, and actually see the code uh, that's there. Um, but this is just kind of shows you some of the, the power of say structured text. Um, so again, starting back at the top where we've got the variables, you know, I've got a, a batch target, uh, integer, double integer, bool. Um, and what this machine does is we, they had these large spool, spools of uh, wire that were, I don't know, 5,000 feet in length, fairly large. And they needed to chop them up into multiple sections of, you know, 50 feet, 75 feet or so at a time. And they would need, you know, 100 pieces of a 75 foot uh, piece of wire. And so I had... I developed a, a little HMI touchscreen where a operator could just put in 75. They could type in, I need 50 pieces and hit go. And what would happen is the saw would come down, basically start at zero, and then it would come back up. And then I had a small encoder uh, that would count off my measurement. I had the VFD would turn on spinning this, this big spool. And once the encoder got to I don't know, I want to say you know, it was 75 feet or so. Once it got to about 70 feet or so, it would actually start to slow down. And then once it got to, I think, you know, 74 feet, it would, then it would start to really creep along. And then once it got to at 75 feet, it would stop. 
the saw would come down and come back up. So you have to think through all that logic. And what I ended up using in here was a, uh, something that you can do in, you know, uh, structured text that would be difficult to do in uh, ladder. And I use what are called switch statements or case statements. And what happened was, you know, so we have the, you know, cycle start, cycle stop. Um, I had a couple of uh, features in here where we could, you know, reset length if we had to start in the middle or somewhere. But, you know, case zero is everything stopped. So we have the motor, the motor stopped, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, limit switches for the saw up and saw down, you know, those both had to be false. Um, the length reset was, was false. And then basically if it met, if this statement here was true, then it could go on to step two. And then it was, okay, saw put down. So that's when the chop saw would come down, kind of mark my zero. We'd come back up and then motor would run. And now, you know, now that we're at zero, now our VFD can run and now we can get to the current length and you can kind of see, uh, you know, if the current length is greater than the target length, so if the current length is 10 feet and we want 75 feet, keep on going. And then uh, kind of going down. Uh, so you're just, so you're basically you're building a, uh, you're building a state machine by hand uh, or uh, programming a yep. state machine. And uh, but that seems like it would be really difficult or at least uh, for the inexperienced, it would be difficult to, to manage that uh, via ladder logic. Yeah, I, I probably spent the first hour or so trying to figure out how to do this in ladder logic. And then I realized that it wasn't going to be worth my time. So that's when I just went back to uh, uh, structured text. Um, the customer did not give me a requirement that it needed to be in ladder logic. Um, I just thought from a trouble student standpoint, it might make it a little bit easier. Um, but it, then this is, this is easier for me than, than ladder logic. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, you know, it depends, you know, depending upon your, your background. Yes. Right. Um, yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, I'd, I'd much rather. So if I were actually doing assessment, <laughs> I'd much rather see this because I could I, I could understand this a little bit and I could, you know, work through the logic and find any uh, logic errors that I might be able to use to take care, uh, take advantage of or um, that uh, uh, figure out where they should be paying some attention to. Uh, one, one of the things that I've seen and one of the things that we use in uh, the ICS 410 class um, is the, the Velocio PLCs and they have function blocks. And so we, we use a, we build a, a state machine like this, but uh, pretty much every one of those cases would be uh, um, a, a block that we're pulling in. So a timer would be, a, you know, we wouldn't have to do the timer by hand. We would just have to put the uh, actual variables in there. And then the, the, the code that you have here uh, would be uh, written for us. It would be compiled on the back end, I guess, so to speak. Yep. So, so you're, you're kind of, you're kind of getting segueing, uh, Okay. into the uh we're taking a step out of out, outside of structured text and looking focusing more on the 61131 um and the ability to kind of use all of these 61131 languages within a uh within a program so you can have the best of both worlds you can use use the languages um as appropriate um you know, for example, if I don't have an example here, but um, if you had an array that you needed to do, um, doing arrays in ladder logic is pretty impossible, um, or I'll, I'll just say it's difficult, maybe not impossible, just very difficult. Um, whereas in structured text, it's, it, it's fairly straightforward. So what you can do is you can actually start to mix and match these programs or these, these languages, um, honestly, just by calling function blocks. So I have another example here from, a third flavor of uh, Codasys. Um, and this is uh, an older version of ABB. It actually uses a Codasys 2.3, which is just a couple of years older. Um, but this was on a, I believe it was a, a, a waste disposal uh, application. Um, and so, you know, again, here's your familiar Codasys, you know, your variables up here. We've got some lab logic. Um, here's your watchdog timer, which is, you know, essentially a, function block um, that we're integrating in here. Uh, so that's not that unusual. You'll see a lot of vendors these days have some sort of function block capability in order to kind of allow ladder logic to be the primary language. But what you can also do is, if you notice over here, not all these symbols are the same. So a lot of them are, are ladder, but there's one right here, 
uh, where we've got some Modbus mapping, we're actually starting to do this in structured text. So we can actually call some Modbus registers and memory registers. And you know, here's, here's more where we're starting to actually do some math in here because um, math is generally difficult in math, math and logic. Um, so you can kind of go down your rungs and you can kind of see where as we get down, uh, you know, rung eight here, um, where we've got our Modbus mapping. So all the programmer did was they just grabbed a function block and said, okay, I need you to call this program. And it maps right onto the structure text. So now you can, you know, now you can start to have these, these black boxes, um, so to speak, where companies could, you know, hide in, hide intellectual property, uh, protect, protect their source code uh, a little bit. So you could give a technician a uh, uh, kind of a, a copy of the uh, of the ladder logic. They can troubleshoot that, but then there might be a couple box, a couple of boxes um, where you can do some math and you know try and keep your code code nice and concise. You know, rather than trying to write this in several lines of ladder, I can just do you know I can just call one function, go right to a structured text, and do it in you know five or five or ten lines, whereas it might take me. 50 lines or so in, and, in ladder. And it, I, I'm kind of keying off what you just said, which was pulling in uh, uh, functions from other vendors, you know, proprietary code and so forth, you know, so that in, in as a part of the uh, SANS ICS summit, one of the biggest things was uh, the, the SBOM, the, the software bill of materials and uh, pulling in uh, these uh, libraries from different vendors that, uh, we may, they may know that there's a, a vulnerability in it uh, and they may get a patch out immediately for most of their stuff, but people aren't necessarily recompiling their programs or pulling in those new libraries for these types of projects. And they, so uh, uh, I'm digressing again, but uh, anytime you pull a third party thing in, especially something that is, uh, um, you can't really put eyes on and analyze it and stuff like that. That's interesting to me. Those, those are the inputs that I want to test as a security uh, uh, researcher. And so that, that's kind of interesting. The, the fact that you can actually do multiple languages in a single program, uh, I didn't realize that. I, I just kind of figured it like I would just do it all in the, the, the one language. So uh, th this is pretty interesting. Yeah. And, and I mean, and, you know, the, Another caveat is, you know, it does depend upon the programming environment. Um, usually some of the more basic ones um, from, from the vendors may only allow you to do ladder. Um, some of the, uh, some other, others may allow you to do, to do multiple languages. So it, it does depend a little bit on the, the actual uh, IDE that you are using. Um, but the, uh, you know, Codasys and its development environment was, was set up to do to do multiple uh, multiple languages, um, okay, and I believe and I believe a lot of the others are are, are coming around to it um, on their on their free versions. Uh, at least. I mean, it, it makes sense <laughs> when we think about when we talk about all of the legacy uh, legacy portions of our control networks. If something works, they're not going to want to redo it. So if you've got ladder logic really? code that works for a specific area, but now you're pulling in these uh, other controls, new sensors, and so forth. But it's easy to easier to implement them uh, via these uh, in some other programming language, uh, you know, because it's provided by the vendor or manufacturer, and they provide the capability of integrating. Then I could absolutely see that uh, happening, uh, but then at the same time, that's where we're mar marrying those uh, technologies. That's where we're mar marrying the uh, the uh, excuse me, not marrying, but um, uh, adding complexity to the parsers and the compilers uh, uh, for these things. And that's, uh, that's where vulnerabilities come from. You know, it's, it's just uh, that complexity is where the vulnerabilities come from. So that, that's really yeah. interesting. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of bringing it back home. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, getting back to, back to plain old structure tax, what we started with. Um, it's a, to me, it's, it's a lot more, uh, user-friendly language. Um, again, to me, I know some people just love ladder logic and that's great, um, but you're not, you can probably do a much better job programming um, if you start to marry all these languages. Um, 
and, and use use them um, as they or I'll say use use them as they are capable of. Um, if that if that makes sense, you know, when when you when you need to do a, a math uh, a math equation, you know, if temperature greater than you know 100 and you're trying to do some some limits, it can be way easier to do it in uh, in a structured text. Um, and I will throw out one of my other little uh, things here. I know, you know, Schneider's got it. Um, there's probably others, but, you know, you can get, they've got a nice little cheat sheet here. Oh, nice. Um, where, you know, you can start to see all of the, uh, you know, various portions of structured text. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's not a very elaborate language, um, but, uh, uh, but it is very useful um, in the in the automation world. Um, so you can start to do your control statements. You know, like I said, you know, if then else your case statements, which we showed a, an example of previously. You can start to do, you know, you can do your while do loops, um, which is very useful. You know, keep on keep on producing widgets until you know the counter uh, the counter uh, uh, is is hit. Um, you can see all the variables. Um, that you would, uh, sorry, variables that you would do, you know, bools, bytes, again, very familiar stuff to, uh, to traditional programmers. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's any other little gems in here that I should, uh, that I should point out. Um, yeah, you, and you may see a lot of these terms that are similar to the function blocks that you're coming across, you know, timer on functions, timer off functions, triggers, rising, rising edge, falling edges, uh, those types of things. So again, you can kind of see where, when you're starting to mix these languages, a lot of the terms are similar. It's just what your one, what language is going to work best, um, and then what you're most comfortable with. Uh, yeah, and I and I think that's really what it boils down to. But you know, from a, a security professional standpoint, so if I have to go in and help, you know, whether I'm doing a, a security assessment uh, or I'm doing some security research, uh, understanding how they're uh, approaching the the programming for uh, that specific process, uh, whether it's a, a third party that's developing it and providing it, uh, or whether they're doing it in-house themselves, uh, just understanding which approach. Uh, first, you have to understand the approach that they're doing, and then you need to understand how to analyze that and evaluate that. So I, I, I think you've helped point that out uh, excellent uh, in this. Um, we're, we're kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, getting right uh, around our time. And uh, so is, is there anything... Um, is there anything that, that we're missing before we kind of uh, finish up? Um, I don't think so. I think I've hit all okay. the points that I wanted to, that I wanted to make, um, you know, just between codices, the, the 61131 languages. Um, yeah. I mean, it was mostly just to show the examples and, you know, show people how familiar it is. Uh, like I said, if you're used to scripting or, or, or whatnot, um, Excellent. That's well, yeah, I, I, I think judge. that's, yep, I, I definitely think that's uh, valuable. And it's exactly what I, I was hoping to uh, show here. And so I, I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, showing how this is actually implemented out there in, you know, control networks, and how the engineers and programmers are going to be leveraging this. So, uh, you know, Mike, once again, I appreciate your time and uh, have a great day. Yeah, thanks a lot, Don. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to another concept overview with the SANS ICS and Cutaway Security teams. Please let us know if there are other topics you would like us to cover in the comments below. If you enjoyed the content, please be sure to like and subscribe to the SANS ICS YouTube channel. This has been Don C. Weber of Cutaway Security. Go forth and do good things.